Hello and welcome to another edition of Into the Issues. I'm Steve Pappas. I will be your host. Uh, I'm honored today to have as my guest the uh, Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Vermont, mm -hmm. uh, actually of Burlington, I guess is technically the term, right? Well, it's the whole state. It's the whole state. Uh, Christopher Coyne, thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Steve. Um, you are celebrating an anniversary right now of five years of um, coming to Vermont, mm -hmm. essentially, and serving in Vermont. And I wanted to talk to you first about um, what that experience, what this experience has meant to you, and, and what do you see as your accomplishments sure. in these five years? Um, well, I, I grew up, I've grown up in New England. Um, grew up just outside of Boston. Uh, was a priest if, if for, the, for Boston for 25 years. And uh, my family uh, had uh, summer cottages in Maine, and we used to ski in Vermont. So, um, you know, I'm very f familiar with the terrain and the people. Mm -hmm. Although I will say that, you know, uh, Vermonters are uh, sui generis in terms of New England. The Vermonters are very different than the rest of New England, um, and um, so it's uh, it's not it's it's not as if you can just kind of move from one from Boston and fit in right away in Vermont. They'll yeah, we they'll take know that great you, pride in that. They know you were a Flatlander. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I was pleased when I was asked to come back here and to uh, be uh, the bishop of, of, of the Burlington, all of Vermont. Uh, I was excited about it. Um, you know, I knew this, I know it's challenging for for anybody uh, who has a revealed religion and on a institutional religion like Catholicism or any of the other ones because uh, Vermont is one of the least religious states in the country, mm. and for all different kinds of reasons. So, but there's also a very strong Catholic community here, and. Uh, and when I came, um, much of what was uh, that the church was struggling with in terms of lawsuits and, litiga and litigation and finances and all that had kind of been resolved. And so I inherited a fairly um, healthy diocese that was looking to move forward away from just kind of maintenance into, into its mission, which is to serve the poor and, and to, to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we've been, you know, and it's been, it's been uh, wonderful. It's, uh, the state is uh, is so different depending upon. I mean, I talked about how New England is different from state to state. Depending on where you're in Vermont, it's different from place to place too. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, there, I mean, that's you have the strongholds, the the Rutlands, for example, which is a completely different community as far as I mean, they, they, it's very entrenched in that community still. Oh, it's got its own personality. The personality of Rutland is very different than the personality of uh, Chittenden County. And it's very, and the, and the personality of uh, Rutland is very different than the personality of Barry. Mm -hmm. I mean, people talk about all oh, those people from Barry, or those people from Rutland, or those people from Burlington. And I always thought that, that was, what are they talking about? And then when you meet the folks and you go, okay, yeah, there's, there's even those little differences um, in character. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I, and it's, um, and, and not, not necessarily negative, but just different ways of, uh, of seeing and perceiving things. So talk a little bit about what. What is the bishop? We all we all kind of hear it. We hear the terms, and we understand that there's a, hi a hierarchy. But um, what does a bishop do? Um, well, uh, basically, I'm like the pastor for the Catholic community in Vermont. So uh, I was missioned here by the Pope. Pope Francis sent me here, um, and he asked me to uh, to be the uh, the pastor for the Catholics. And to work with, because I can't be everywhere all at once, to work with the priests and uh, the parishes and the people. And so my primary role is to is to serve the community, um, to maintain uh, our Catholic um, mission, um, the great works that we do to help the poor and the needy and the marginalized, but also to uh, maintain our churches, to preach the gospel and the Catholic faith, uh, to... Uh, to be people who are involved in serving the common good mm -hmm. and not separate from the common good, but, but part of it, uh, to be good citizens, all those things. Um, so as a bishop, my, my role is to, um, is to be the pastor. In other words, be out there, listen to people, try and do everything I can to support the good works and the, and the works of the, of, the, of the priests there. And also to uh, try and, and teach the faith. I mean, when bishops in the Catholic Church um, we're ordained, which means we're, we're um, ordered to, um, to the church's tradition. Uh, we're not, when I, when I was made a bishop back over 10 years ago now, 
Um, the oath of, pro of obedience that I took was like two pages long, and it's basically, you know, uh, you will do everything that you can to maintain the tradition and teachings of the church in all matters of faith and morals in all times and all places, and to um, in, in complete fidelity and obedience, heart, soul, mind. So we're not, in a way, I'm, not, I'm more of a, um, when it comes to those things, I'm more of a curator or a, um, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a creative theologian. In other words, I'm not called to be someone who kind of tries to move the line on these things. So as such, such more than someone who tries to explain why the church believes what it believes and mm -hmm. to do so in a way that's clear. But also, you know, um, to be open to the possibility of, of change as necessary. Um, which raises an interesting point because it, it feels like um, Catholicism is is in many ways very strict in in, in what it's adhering to and, and kind of how it expects um, its its following to also you know live a certain way and be a certain way and um, and yet. It is adapting in a way that, um, in a lot of ways, I think is seen as positive. And you've embraced it. For example, the the climate, uh, accepting climate change, mm -hmm. um, and um, and having the Pope come out with a, such a powerful statement and an articulate statement that that is aligned with the times. And yet, there are other things about the Church that are challenging. They have to be challenging for you to be able to accept and. And as you say, explain to everyone who's following that, well, this is the way the church sure. believes it should be. Um, how do you how do you personally find yourself um, serving, kind of straddling those two worlds of the hard line of the church and then kind of the needs and the changing that needs to take place in a modern world? Sure, I think. Um I always say to people that I'm not a politician, I'm a pastor, and I try and avoid politics as much as possible. Mm. But even when I feel, even when I put out what I, what I think is a neutral statement or a teaching, I get complaints from both ends. I'll get complaints from the liberal side saying, you're, you're feeding, you're, you're playing to the, your conservative base. And I'll get complaints from the conservative side saying, you're playing, playing to the liberal base. Yeah. So I think the message of Jesus Christ that's found in the church uh, is one that challenges all of us right across the spectrum of our life regardless of where our political um, stance may lie. Mm. And so that when you when you stand up in front of, when you stand up and you say this is what the church believes, it's it ends up kind of embracing and welcoming a lot of people but it also ends up offending many across this because it's, 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 a, it's a message that challenges. It's not easy to be a Roman Catholic mm -hmm. in the fullness of the faith. It's a very, uh, it's, it's, it's not um, it's not a life, it's a life that's very separate from and different from the cultures in which we find ourselves in the first world. Mm -hmm. um, but also Roman Catholicism is a worldwide faith. And so when you start talking about um, the teaching of the church in the Catholic Church, it's not just the teaching here of the church in the state of Vermont or in the United States or in Canada or in Europe. It's in the largest places, it's the places in which most Catholics live today, which is in uh, South America, Asia, and Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, they fought about those Catholics and those uh, continents uh, uh, numbers by far in the first world. And they tend to be very traditional. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you talk about things like empowerment of women in, uh, in the church and trying to, um, you know, open the door to perhaps like a, an ordained women diaconate, which is, a, you know, it's a, it's a service uh, mm -hmm. below, uh, not below, but in, it's different from the priesthood, but it's a service that's there. But it's never been, it's never been really lifted up as a possibility of the church until recently. You know, we in the first world can hear it and say, this sounds reasonable, let's continue and explore it, but then you'll get a lot of blowback from the more traditional societies in Africa and Asia, and they'll say, we're not interested in this because we believe in the male hierarchical life, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, that's hard um, to deal with. I, I think, um, you know, I, th I always just say, can I say something? There's a line from uh, one of St. Paul's letters. He says, only, say only the things that, are, that men and women need to hear, things that are really going to lift them up. And so that's where I start. Take the high road, try and lift people up. And while being um, committed to the church's teaching, I always say, how can I help this teaching 
right now with this particular person sitting right in front of me to, to find a path mm -hmm. that is one that doesn't close a door but continues to leave a door open. Mm -hmm. Do you find that, um, that church is a community? I mean, that's why a lot of people really embrace it, not just because of faith, but because there's a routine to it. There's a camaraderie to it. There's a brotherhood and sisterhood to it. And, and that has eroded a lot over time, whether it's you can blame it on devices, you can blame it on different things, but we're seeing we're seeing it in social clubs, we're seeing it in churches, we're seeing it um, just in general that we're not interacting as much face-to-face -face and faith in faith, I guess. And that has affected the church. I mean, you, it, all, all denominations seem to be struggling with this loss of community. Sure. I mean, yeah, and, uh, and it's not just like, you, that's a real important point, it's not just the Catholic Church, it's any organized religion. Um, Catholicism, the other Christian churches, Episcopalianism, Methodism, um, Judaism, uh, the Mormons are starting to experience it. Uh, those revealed religions are seeing a loss of membership that's accelerating. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and it's, it's like, how do you stem the tide? But you raised a point at the, at the very beginning about other social clubs. There was a uh, book that came out about 20 years ago called Bowling Alone, and it was written by a sociologist. And he started talking about the fact that even 20 years ago, um, garden clubs, bowling, it was bowling leagues was, was the example that he used, uh, men's clubs like Elks Clubs, Knights of Columbus, Lions Clubs, uh, were seeing real declines mm -hmm. in the number of people who were actually joining these places. But what's interesting, he in the point of later on when they come back to, just a few years ago, they came back to the premise of bowling alone about the bowling league and the loss of membership and all that. Um, the, the decline of the bowling league is, is most is gone. Most leagues are gone. The number of people who are actually bowling is up, mm. but they're not joining leagues. And the, the reason why they'll say is they need the freedom because their life is so uh, unplanned and there's so many demands upon them. They don't want to commit themselves to uh, an organization that requires them to be at different places at different times uh, regularly and, um, and that require, has rules and regs and all these other things. They'd rather just go to the, um, to the bowling alley and bowl. Hmm. Um, and it's the same when people say, I'm spiritual but I'm not religious. They're basically saying, I'd rather, I want to go to the bowling alley but not bowl. I want to pray but I don't want to join the church because I don't need that organization. I don't see it as something that I can fit into my life. That's especially true with the millennials because the millennials right now, though, and even the post-millennials, which we're getting into, uh, by the time they, in their mid-40s, on average, they've moved 19 times. Mm. So if you've got a very mobile group of young people, how do you, how do you get them to join a church, a parish, when they're not going to be there very long? Mm -hmm. Now, they, the movement can be like one apartment within a city, but oftentimes it's to another city, it's another state, another country. Um, you know, I think it's a, those are the kind of challenges we face today as an organized religion is how do you continue to connect with people who are so mobile and culturally are not, are not, don't get the idea of joining. Mm -hmm. how, how does that translate into problems for the church or challenges for the church? You can't rely, any church like ours, you can't rely on, on, a, on a stationary number of people who are going to be there every weekend mm -hmm. and support the church every weekend, both with their, uh, with their time and their talents, but also with their finances. So um, there are many people out there who would say, I consider myself Roman Catholic, but they don't belong to a church or a parish or what's out there. So um, I think one of the ways we have to, to begin to address this is to think of creative ways of, uh, or look back at our past. So for example, within the Christian tradition before the, uh, you know, predates Protestantism and Catholicism's breakup, there were things called confraternities, which were loose gatherings of, ca of Christians that were not dependent necessarily on geography. So if you were, uh, if you belonged to the confraternity of St. Nicholas, and that was what you, you know, you kind of committed yourself to and you prayed to and that was what your, your spiritual life went. If you traveled or if you went from place to place, you could plug yourself into the confraternity of St. Nicholas that's there. Mm -hmm. And you start thinking about things like in the Catholic faith for young people, you say, 
maybe we could have a confraternity where, um, you know, a particular saint, we name it after a particular saint, and every diocese would have a confraternity. So when a young person in a, or young people move to a new place, they know that they can always go on Sunday night at 7 o'clock to the confraternity of St. Peter in this place. So this, the confraternity would always have a regular, it's always Sunday night, it's always 7 o'clock, there's always fellowship, there's always a mass, mm -hmm. you know, they plug themselves into that. So it's, it's those kinds of things, those creative ways of rethinking these things that could be helpful. If you go back to the, the bowling league example and you were saying that the, while the leagues tend to have, have waned, that the participation is up, um, it's up because bowling's fun, right? I mean, that's just something that people want to go out and do for recreation. Is there, is what you're talking about kind of steps toward getting away from the structure of being active in religion and um, allowing spirituality to have a different definition than going to church? Right. I think it's a whole change in the way we understand religion or Catholicism. Catholicism is a way of life. Mm -hmm. um, when I, as a Roman Catholic, I have embraced a particular way of being in the world uh, based upon faith in God, faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's the way, and, and I've embraced that. And the things like going to Mass or Sunday celebrations or um, my prayer, whatever it may be, are manifestations of that being. They, they, they uh, support, they're part of who I am. But the most important thing is to recognize first and foremost that I have a, I am a disciple. You know, when someone becomes, uh, wants to be, become a Buddhist, they have to embrace the teaching of Buddha. And that becomes the way in which they live in this world. They're a Buddhist and they live that way. And some of the, some of the, uh, the, the requirements of, 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 uh, of Buddhism are just as strict or if not more strict than Catholic faith. Right. But people embrace that. Too often, it's uh, Catholicism has been for us a, a cultural Catholicism, where uh, it's 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 this putting on of certain practices without the understanding of it being a, a way of being in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, I think if you start with encouraging people to recognize that being Catholic first and foremost means that you have embraced a teaching and a discipleship about how you're going to live in the world and and live it out, and then then out of that you begin to participate. When you're in, when you're traveling or where you're elsewhere in the common life of that community, for, for to offer prayer and worship, but also to be sustained and nourished, in in your in your discipleship, um, I think that that makes that'll make a big difference. And that's the one thing we're trying to we're talking to people more and more about is becoming disciples first, and Catholics second. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that it, that is challenging for a lot of people. When when you talk to young people about why they left the church, most of them will say, I don't need it, uh, it's intolerant, that's the other thing that you'll hear that, um, the views of the church are very intolerant, or uh, I don't need someone telling me how to live my life, I don't need rules and regulations, I don't want rules and regulations, I'm a good person, I don't want the guilt trip on. It's, those are the things that are kind of right there, and that's when you can see right there, that's, they've chosen a different way of being in the world than what the church has called them to. Mm -hmm. Is the church intolerant? It's intolerant of certain behaviors, um, but it, I always make an effort to talk about what we're for. I don't talk about what we're against. Um, you know, and we tend to be defined um, by um, by certain you know, neuralgic issues in society that are uh, the uh, you know the gender wars the. Uh, political correct um, issues that are all out there that we're often defined by. But people say, you know, um, you know, they'll say, well, you say I'm not a good Catholic because um, I'm, uh, I'm in a same-sex marriage. So you're saying I'm not a good Catholic and I can't be in the church. And I always say, well, that's, you know, that's only one small part of who you are. You know, and so you know, we don't, I'm not going to define you by that. I, I would actually challenge you to ask questions like how, how do you treat your brother and sister? How do you treat the marginalized? How do you how do you express your, your if you say, I'm, st I'm st even though this is my relationship, this is who I am, how do you fall into in terms of the rest of what the church is teaching on this matter? I, to me, um, the, the, the neuralgic issues of, of gender and, and sexuality and all that, 
they're there and, and they're part of what we, our discussion is, but I don't usually preach about them or anything from the pulpit. I'm more worried, I'm more concerned about where's your love of neighbor, where's your love of God, where's your, where's your charity, where's your mercy, where's your, are you, where, are you someone who's involved in social justice, social action, all these other things, you mm -hmm. know? Um, you know, as I remember, talk, I remember Cardinal O'Malley down in Boston one time when people said, you know, why is the church so fixated on sexuality? And he said to the media, he said, I'm not fixated on, you're the ones that were always asking the questions. I'm not up here preaching about it, talking about it all the time. Mm. And so uh, I hope to try and convince people to, to define us less than, than those things that are challenges to discipleship and more by things that, that, are, that are, you know, that are worthy of the church. I mean, the Catholic Church in Vermont is supplies so many good things and so much just so much good work that people when you add it all up it's we're one of the largest providers of social services private providers of social services in the state by far mm. yeah. um, you were talking a little bit um, off the air about um, kind of what some of that work is and I'd like you to talk a little bit about about what you what the church has done and in the services it provides in that means because it's a pretty it's impressive yeah when I was when I got here in uh, five years ago one of the things I said to people and working with them is to say I don't want to create a Catholic ghetto of social services so if in your local area there's already a food bank there's no need for us to have a Catholic food bank let's just support that food bank as Catholics and be present to that community, and and you know be there as Catholics and talk about our faith and and be witnesses to our faith within that community. So we we try and support like the Burlington Food Pantry, for example, in Burlington, and uh, um, in Chittenden County, you know we don't have a Catholic uh, shelter for families. Instead, we we com we've connected with and, and committed to COTS, mm -hmm. um, a local shelter community. So where there's already good things being done within the common good, we're, we plug ourselves into that and support it. Um, going to Salvation Army, feeding, feeding uh, meals, things like that. So um, one, of the, one thing that we do though, do though, where there, uh, that is not um, really carried out by any other agency except for this group called ACORN in Chittenden County, is we provide emergency help to underemployed families. So uh, we have, a, we are, through Vermont Catholic Charities, we have uh, a significant amount of money that's available each month to families that are, you know, mothers working or the, both the parents are working. They're just getting by and there's a catastrophic illness and they have a big bill or the engine on the, mini, on the minivan went or they have to move but they don't have enough money to pay for the deposit on the apartment or they've got this huge oil bill that they can't pay, we, we help them with that. So it's, there's a, that's a niche right there for us that we do, and we continue to do that. We, and it's not just Chittenden County, it's, it's anywhere within the state we try and help anybody, irregardless of, of they don't have to be Catholic. Mm -hmm. they, just, they just need help, we help them. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, we, every one of our parishes has some kind of an outreach, whether it's to a food shelter or uh, they, or they might even have their own food pantry. Some places do. Uh, there's a big one down in Brattleboro, St. Michael's Parish has a huge one that serves meals, hot meals every day hmm. um, there, and it's very big. And there's a number, a couple of other ones like that around the state. But um, but we also, you know, we provide all those social services, so it's, it's, a, it's a large amount of work that we do. But we also have something called the de Gosbrian Fund, which is named after the first Catholic Bishop of Vermont, uh, Louis de Gosbrian. And... Uh, we distribute uh, grants to worthy organ to organizations that that make an application all throughout the state, and they're not Catholic organizations. Uh, obviously, they have to be organizations that don't do anything that's contrary to our teaching. But um, we all across the state we give out grants over the course of uh, of each year, for, and we've been doing it for ten years, and we've given out over half a million dollars in grants uh, through the Louis de Gosbrin grant uh, uh, through collection. And it goes to food banks, and it goes to uh, shelters for, for families, and provides daycare for um, for elders, citizens, and transportation for people who are out in rural parts of the state that don't have cars but still need to get to doctors and things like that. So those are the kinds of things that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and 
if, I mean, it, it, the list is pretty significant in terms of the, of the groups that we hurt. So, help, excuse me. So, I, I think that Catholics, we live our faith in terms of, we, we, we do a lot of good work with missions. Mm -hmm. How many parishes are there statewide? 72 mm -hmm. and 114 churches, because some parishes have more than one or two churches. Yep. Um, going back to that sense of community and, and the people who say that they want to, so you talked about the young people saying they want to leave the church. Why do young people say they want to go to the church? For, they want um, to become a Catholic. Some people, yeah. because a lot of them um, have become disciples. Mm -hmm. They really embrace the, the teaching of the church. Um, they want to, um, to live it out. They first get attracted a lot of times by social ministry, social missions, things that we do. Um, they get involved with us in the kind of outreach that we do to the community or um, the trips, the support of places in Haiti and other countries that we'll do. Mm. Um, there, that, that, uh, those kind of social missions, social works that the church does is kind of gets them in the door and then they begin to see people praying and talking about their faith and the next thing you know, they're very committed to it. And then once they become part, they become more and more active in the church, they find a church where they feel at home and they really um, become very enthralled with the mystery of the Catholic Church's liturgies, which, if done well, can, are very beautiful and, and are very mystical and, and different in a way that the culture is different. And so um, they're attracted by that. They're attracted by the differentness of Catholicism and its religion. Um, there's a segment who are attracted to the old way in which we used to have our liturgy, which was in Latin and all that. And we have a small community of, of those folks in, in, in Vermont and there's a large number of young people who go to those. They're mm -hmm. very enthralled by the old practice, and, uh, and they, they, uh, they're very committed to it, and they try and live their life accordingly, too, from it. So um, the ones that are staying, they're staying because they become disciples. It's mm -hmm. not just, they're not cultural Catholics. And conversely, you have to be running up against a lot of individuals of all ages who are just mad at the Catholic Church right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and rightly so. And the Catholic Church has allowed certain behavior to go on for... They had allowed, yeah. 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 Um, and Vermont, Vermont was not immune to it. Um, your approach to addressing that was very unusual. It, it impressed many, it drew a lot of criticism but you asked for an independent review of the diocese mm -hmm. files. Um, and I think there were a lot of people in the media and uh, otherwise who questioned whether it was really independent or not. But for all intents and purposes, I know Mike Donahue. He's not going to let anything kind of stray. Um, and you have said that you were satisfied with the findings of um, that that group of individuals who came in. I, I can't remember how many there were total. Um, and that they had done their review and you were not looking. Nobody was looking for um, the specifics to, you know, to pull all the dirt out of it. All it was was a confirmation that you wanted to identify the breadth and depth, depth of the problem. And you're satisfied with those results, right? I think um, when I asked the seven laymen and women, um, six of whom were Catholic, one of whom was not, uh, he was a Quaker, or is a Quaker, to, uh, to do this, I didn't realize the amount of work that was involved for them, and I don't, they didn't either, hmm. um, but the amount of work that they put in and hours that they put in to produce the finding in the report was, uh, I couldn't, uh, I just can't say thank you to them enough. Hmm. But I had promised them, I met with them once at the beginning and once at the end and I promised them full cooperation. And so they had full access to all of the priest files, not just the ones that we had identified as having um, allegations of abuse of a, of a minor in them, but if they were reading along and they saw a reference to a priest that they didn't have, they'd say, can we see Father Jones's file? So when they needed to see other files, they, they saw them. Mm -hmm. um, they were also um, agreed to strict confidentiality and privacy of those uh, priests who may have um, who they might have looked at, but they didn't. They said there was just nothing there, mm -hmm. so they're not. Gonna, they weren't going to say, "Well, we did look at Father Jones's file, but there's nothing there." Um, and then at the end, I told them that I would re 
once they produce their report, I would produce it, I would promulgate it, produce it as they wrote it, and I wasn't going to edit it, which I did. Um, at the same time, the state attorney general's office is going through the same files, so they have all the same things that we that they had, and. Uh, uh, strictly speaking, it would do me no good to to try and cover up anything or hide anything, knowing that the state attorney general has it, and, and they're going to be diligent in this. And mm. so, I didn't want to produce. I didn't want them or anybody to produce a report that was then going to be overturned or or seen to be kind of uh, less than complete. Uh, I think it has accomplished what. It, there was two things. One was one sad. There were families that were hurt and upset because their their beloved brother or uncle. His name was uh, was sent. To, the man's dead. The priest is dead, but it was his name was made public because there were allegations that were found to be credible and substantial. And they said, you know, this guy, my our uncle, has no way to. to we know he didn't do it. He talked about this allegation, um, and uh, he can't defend himself. And now his name's out there, and it's being smeared and slandered. And why'd you do that? And uh, the problem, the issue is. Well, and not in this case in particular, but in other cases, we had names made public that had not been made public before. And this is the second thing is that it did accomplish is that we've had people come and say, I was also abused by Father Smith, but his ne I never saw his name, so I was always afraid to come forward because I, as the only one, I didn't think anybody would believe me. Mm -hmm. Now I know that I was not alone. And so we've had we've been able to talk to them, have conversations with them, make restitution with them privately as we can. So the idea of putting out the list was not just to to air out all of the um, sins of the past because these things are all 20, 25 years ago, and thank God we've not had any allegation of abuse of a minor in in 20, 25 years, 25 years. Um, is again just to say just exactly what we did. Um, to say some of these folks, you know, uh, that have been out there quietly hurting, um, that you in fact weren't alone, and that we um, we b do believe you, mm -hmm. you know. Were you you knew you were going to take some heat for taking that approach, though? I mean, I, I can't imagine that that there were that everybody in the Catholic Church said Bishop Coyne's got this one. You know, the transparency is going to be good for it. Good for oh, everybody. I know. I've, I've been in just local, locally. You know, my brother bishops. There are guys who just completely disagree with me. They th they think they th they believe that I threw the priests under the bus, mm -hmm. especially the ones that are dead. And um, I I again, but I always say there's nothing. It's scripture. There's nothing hidden that will not be revealed. You know. And so the only way we're going to get beyond this is to be completely transparent about what happened, honest about what would happen, and put it out there even though it's hurtful f for, for me and everyone else who's part of our church. It hurts a lot to see the, 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 what, did, what was allowed to happen and how many families and children were abused and all that, uh, and the kind of um, wound on the body. But, you know, when you go back and you start talking to these old guys, or, or, or even the older bishops back when, when this all started back in 2000, 2003, they would say we were trying to protect the church, you know. When we didn't, when we covered this up, we were trying to protect the church. The church, but they forgot that those families and those children—they're the church too. I mean, what you were saying is the, the church defined only as the clergy, mm -hmm. forgetting all the rest of the church, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that that's a, a very important reality that we've kind of just said that just doesn't have carry any water. Mm -hmm. You can't. We will not say that. We can't say that won't say that. Well, and that's where I think 90% of your blowback comes from, is that there's, you can't have that. You can't have it be protecting the clergy when, uh, you know. We're only one part. You're we're only one part of the church, exactly. Right. And, you, and, you know, and when the, when, the, when the church gets sued uh, for these things, they're not suing me. Uh, uh, my personal property, as, as Chris Coyne, isn't, isn't going to go anywhere. Hmm. It's Everything, every dollar, and every good, generous gift that was made by people—that's what the money's coming from. And the, so they're the ones that are being, in a way, are are. If you want to talk about injustice, they're the ones that are paying for the sins of clergy, who oftentimes were abusing them. 
and their families. So it, it's just, it's, it's, it's an awful situation to be in right now. When you started out, you, you couldn't have, have known as a young man that the profession that you were going to take upon was going to turn into this, could you? No, but I, I grew up in a huge uh, Catholic parish. Uh, priests were always around our house. I had seven, seven, uh, seven, six brothers and sisters, seven of us. We were very active in the church, and, and we were always, uh, we had priests. And none of us, knock on wood, were ever abused. But there was one guy that my brothers, my older brothers, used to just stay away from him. He's creepy. You know, they used to call him Father Touch and Feel. So mm -hmm. we kind of knew that these guys were out there, mm -hmm. and, uh, but we, um, we avoided them because, you know, I just was lucky. Um, when I was in seminary, um, back in 80 to 86, there was, uh, we got a lot of, uh, this is just when the stuff is starting to burble to the top, and we had a lot of um, rector's conferences and others on boundaries, mm -hmm. and they used to tell us to stay away from, um, from, uh, from, from children, you know, you're not to be alone with children, you, if you see a priest who's with children a lot, you have to let us know. This is like 1986. This is way before the Boston Globe story in 2002. So there was already this kind of a real awareness within the local, within the church community as guys who were being trained that we had to be catching these things and being vigilant about it. Um, then when the story broke in 2002 and I was teaching, I was a seminary professor at that time and I was teaching guys to be seminary, uh, to be priests, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was hard. The scope of it, we didn't know, especially in Boston, we didn't know. Nobody was aware of the scope of it. Um, but as it started to play out more and more, it, the, the catastrophic nature of what had happened, what had been covered up, and how many people had been abused was, uh, was just numbing. Um, and I was very much involved on in all kinds of different levels on, on dealing with this in Boston. The thing, the biggest takeaway for me in terms of like just sheer numbers is, the 11 worst priest perpetrators in Boston were responsible for 90% of the victims. And, I, and if we had ever, we, and we knew, and these guys had records, if we had ever just taken them out when we should have, I'm thinking how many less, how many, how many fewer, fewer children kids. would have been hurt? It's mind boggling when you look, and same is true in Vermont. The, the, two, the two or three worst perpetrators were responsible for the vast majority of, of cases. They were these guys who were who were pedophiles, are were serial abusers, and um, and they they just had hundreds of victims. You know, and the victims close to 100 or over 100. A lot of them. At any point, did you feel that this was a test of your faith and that you needed to walk away? No. Because, uh, and even, not, even today, um, I feel like I have to make reparation for it. And if I walk away, I'm, I'm abandoning uh, the ownership of what happened. I'm abandoning uh, the necessity of being honest and transparent and, and making amends. I'm abandoning the people who were hurt. I mean, um, like I said, the people in the pews didn't do it. Um, they had these guys assigned to them. And then these guys abused their children. So they had no call. They had no call of who could go there and who not. Mm -hmm. So if I walk away, I'm walking away from them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it's, we're, in the call, we're in the bishop's chain and being the bishop. If the Holy Father uh, told, called, the Pope called me up tomorrow and said, I want your resignation, I'd say, oh, thank you. <laughs> Can I go back to being a parish priest again? <laughs> but, uh, but that's not what I'm called to do, and so I just do the best I can right now. Do you feel that there should be criminal charges brought? I wish there could have been. I wish, I wish, I really wish that um, there's not a lot of them alive, the right. guys who did it. But even when it was back then, I, I really wish, yeah, that we could have, um, that the statute of limitations could have been removed for criminal, uh, which it can't be. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I think, I think these guys should have gone to jail. I really, like anybody else, they should have gone to jail. Do you feel like the church is doing enough now to to protect? Oh, oh yeah. No, I think I think we've learned. Uh, we've one of the we've <coughs> excuse me. We've learned our lesson. Um, 
you know, one of the, the, like I said, I talk about the sins of the past. Church in the United States, with some, ex with a few exceptions, but for the most part, we put into place protocols to protect children and to keep um, abusers away from children and to train volunteers and children about the, um, the hints or the, uh, the, you know, the suspicions, you know, what do you, what do you look for to see if a child's being groomed? Uh, what do you look for in terms of adult inappropriate adult behaviors? How do you report it? Um, here in the state of Vermont and, every, and pretty much everywhere else in the United States, when we get any kind of an allegation involving either an adult volunteer or a clergy uh, of a, a possible abuse of a child, we go right to the police or, or the Department of Ch uh, Children and Families. And we don't handle it at all. We turn it over right away. And it used to be handled inside first. You know, we'd, well, let's look at it, let's figure it out, and then we'll decide whether, where we're going to go with it. You know, we're, first of all, we're mandatory reporters, but uh, secondly, that's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Do you have, is, was there a defining moment in this entire process where um, just one specific thing happened that, that will always be, you will always carry that with you? I mean, you mentioned the number um, of the abusers, but has there been somebody coming to you and saying, I was abused, or one, I guess one thing that, that just, about the whole topic that haunts you? Um, I was the spokesperson, public relations person for the diocese, Archdiocese of Boston from 2002 to 2006. So I was constantly out in front of the media dealing with this stuff all the day. Yeah. And uh, I remember a really brutal press conference and, you know, and I was doing my best to try and answer questions and all that. It was just awful. and. You know, and and uh, and all that, and then so then I came out from the press conference, and and one of the staff who worked with me uh, said to me, "Can I talk to you?" And I said, "Yeah." And so we went into we went aside and we sat down, and he said, and he broke down, and he said, "I, I was abused by a priest," and I didn't know that. I didn't know that. And so we talked, and and, we, and I also he and he and I, he, and I said, "You know that you reported this to me. Now we we have to go to." We have to do the protocols, and he goes, "Yeah, I knew that's one of the reasons why." He says, "I'm not looking for money." He says, um, I, "I just want to see the guy. I just need to know whether the guy um, is still in active ministry." And I said, "Okay." So we we looked at the directory and we looked up the guy's name, and the guy had died like three or four years ago, and he was abused when he was 11, and he cried because he said, "I always I feel so guilty because if I had done something." and stopped him, I, then no other kids would have been hurt by him, but I couldn't do it. He was blaming himself mm. because he was only, he was 11, but he was thinking if I had been brave and stopped him, this man wouldn't have abused anybody else. And then we talked for a while, and then at the end he said to me, and I, I just want to thank you for being here and doing what you're doing. Because, uh, and he said, uh, when every time you stand up and you try and do what you do, and I see what you're trying to do, I feel better. And I always remember that. I was, two things, I remember just how my heart broke when he said, I didn't stop him. And I think of all those other kids who got hurt by him because I was not brave enough. And I said, you were 11. And you've been, and, and you've been carrying that around all these years. And then just to have him actually just to affirm me even in that moment, to affirm me and say, I appreciate what you're doing, was a very important moment. And the story goes on. But, he was just a great guy, and then um, he actually died of a brain tumor like two years later. Uh, and uh, when we when we had the, when the story, uh, he said uh, he said my wife's going to be uh, uh, calling because uh, I told her I was going to be talking to you because I knew his wife as well. And so she's uh, she, um, she said I said well what do I do if she calls looking for you? And he says well just tell her we had a meeting or something like that. And I said I said okay, and then. Um, she never called, but then he came back to see me the next day. He said, you know, I was thinking about it when I went home, he said, and, I, and what I had asked you to do, he said, I'd never lied to my wife before in my life, and so I went home and I told her. He said, so uh, she didn't call you, and I'm glad she didn't, but uh, she knows now, too. So I mean, he's just the kind of stand-up guy he was. Mm -hmm. And he never went public with it, and at his funeral, which I did, and with his three daughters there and his wife, um, nobody knew that, uh, I'll say his name was John, that John was an abuse victim. 
but John also was doing a lot of work to help people who were abused themselves. Mm -hmm. This has been an unbelievable test of, of so many people, and it's brought out so many layers of courage and bravery, and uh, on lots of fronts. And it, you know, it's it's been it's been hard to watch from the media's point of view too, because it's been such a struggle, and it's been, you know, we understand. That we don't want to be re-victimizing people, but we also want to be able to say how, you know, how this has played out and, and, and chronicle the extent of it. Right. I think the hardest thing, um, and it's and you know as someone in the media how this plays out, is that when a story like this gets reported, it's it's seen as if happening now, rather than recognizing that it was it happened. We're talking generation a generation ago now. Mm -hmm. We're talking 25 years ago. But many people still believe that children are being abused by priests in the United States, even though they're not. But they still believe that. And that's even people in the pews. When you, when people, when you say to people in the pews, do you still believe that children are being abused by priests, they'll say yes. Mm -hmm. Contrary to facts, but that's, again, it's the narrative and the way it plays out. You know, um, the BuzzFeed story on the orphanage in, in Burlington, um, I had people sending me emails saying, you need to close that orphanage. I'd send back and say, if you read a little bit further into the article, you'd realize it was closed in 1974. It's the nature of what we do. When I worked with the media, I always just tried to be as honest as I could and helpful to them. I just said they're just trying to do their job. They're not my enemies. And there were others around the room who felt otherwise, but it did it did actually help us, I think. Mm -hmm. um, just a couple minutes left. I want to talk a little bit about um, I see you as a progressive. I maybe you don't call yourself a progressive, I see you as a progressive, and I think most people who probably don't know you think you're pretty progressive as far as um, as being a leader in the state. Um, and I had asked you prior to coming on the air if you felt like that made you a fit in Vermont or not, because we all think we're pretty progressive in Vermont. And your answer intrigued me. You said it's just the way that you are. And that you're not trying to bend in one way or another, um, and that there's a, you have a very pragmatic approach that, as, as I indicated earlier, can't necessarily be um, in lockstep with the church. And I just wonder about how, um, if you feel that you are able to do your best work, again straddling what happens what has to happen in the structure of the church and who Christopher Coyne is as a man. You know, um, as, a, as a man, my, my, my faith first and foremost uh, and belief in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ and the church and all that is what, where I start. And that informs all aspects of my life. And it does place me oftentimes in a, in a in a, in, in, in a place where you can't categorize me. So on the one hand, um, uh, and I'll use, I'll use the language of, of, the, of discussion, um, when it comes to questions of a woman's reproductive freedom, uh, you know, I'm very much, a, I could, I'm very much a, could be labeled as an arch conservative on this, on this you know, and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, placed in that category. And if that's the only, only uh, uh, topic you're gonna judge me on, then you could do that. But, but on the other hand, when it comes to climate control, when it comes to, uh, um, when it comes to uh, not climate control, climate uh, challenge, uh, crisis, mm -hmm. uh, climate control is what we're doing here in the building when we, with the HV. <laughs> um, but, uh, or um, immigration, welcoming of refugees, uh, the appalling situation on the border down in Mexico, and children and families dying, and all that, uh, then, then that is the whole other side of the spectrum. You know, I'm saying it's hard to place a true a Catholic believer on one category or another. Mm -hmm. I, I am a Pope Francis bishop. Uh, I believe in his, what he's doing. I wholeheartedly accept everything that he's doing. Um, I was also a Pope Benedict bishop. Um, when the Pope, there were th uh, there were there, there were times where I struggled a little bit with some of his more conservative 
uh, statements and, and teachings, but I accept that I, in obedience, accepted them and, and all that. So it's not like, uh, it's not a thoughtless follow the leader type thing, but, um, you know, when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm with the United States Conference of Bishops meetings, um, clearly people know where I stand on, on matters of faith and morals. And the do they have, do you have your own corner? Uh, <laughs> I sit pretty much in the same place but around me are guys that I completely agree with, you know, mm -hmm. disagree right. with. And I'll sit down after getting up at the microphone and, and one of the next to me will say, well, that was just a bunch of baloney that you, or they don't use that word even, they'll say, mm. you know, uh, you, you do know I disagree with everything you just said. And I said, yes, thank you, I love you too. Mm. You know, um, so the, the bishops are just as divided anyway as any other group of people in the United States. And the same is the church with the church. So, yeah, I am, I, I guess you could say I'm progressive. I'm progressive in fostering the life of the church and the teachings of the faith in its fullness and not just to, to you know, be a, what they call a cafeteria Catholic. I agree with this, so that's what I'm going to take, but I'm going to leave the rest of this on the plate, mm -hmm. off the plate, because I don't agree with that. Well, you can't, I just don't see how you can be uh, a practicing Roman Catholic and not be ready to figure out ways of welcoming strangers and refugees and needy people to the table. Yeah. And also not care for God's creation. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. This has been a very illuminating and, and thorough conversation. And uh, I want to, I personally want to thank you for coming in and taking the time to reach out to a, a, an audience on public access. So, and Christopher Coyne, thank you very much. Steve Peppers, you're welcome. Um, and thank you for watching another edition of Into the Issues. Uh, until we meet again, stay tuned.